Um, members of the audience are welcome to ask questions and share insight on Committee of the Whole agenda items as they are being considered by the school board. Please raise your hand to be recognized by the board president. You're asked to come to the microphone so that everyone can hear your question or idea. We ask that you keep your comments focused on the agenda item being considered. Um, with that, we will have a um, roll call. Jesse? Here. 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 Present. Here. 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 Okay, thank you. Oh, and moving on to item C, do we have approval of the agenda as presented? Do we have a motion? We approve the agenda as presented. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Moving on to um, item two, the presentation section of the evening. And we are going to start with the um, item A, student, staff, and community recognition. And we have, um, starting with um, Dennis Schurz and um, Miss um, Susie Olson Rosenbush. Yeah. And uh, she is not here. She's working. <laughs> working. <laughs> Perfect. So um, <coughs> I'll read this for everyone, though. Um, Susie Olson Rosenbush and the Spooner FFA were recognized at the Wisconsin Fair Association Conference in January. Spooner FFA was selected as the Volunteer Group of the Year. This award is given to one organization statewide each year for outstanding long-term service to their county fair. Susie Olson Rosenbush and the late Mr. Dan Rosenbush were also selected for the Wisconsin Association of Fairs Hall of Fame Award. Up to four of these awards are given each year. This award is given for 12 or more years of dedicated service to their county fair as fair board members. We'd like to say congratulations. <laughs> and then we will have, um, let's see, Mr. Fiesel and we have um, Maylee Baker, Tabitha Johnson, Ava Young, Sienna Steins, and Claire Cleveland. These high school students are members of our out of school time at SES SMS. They assist and tutor students with homework and help facilitate club opportunities. They both make a great difference and our students look up to them. They demonstrate ex exemplary leadership and character in supporting students. Thank you for being excellent role models. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, and then moving on to Item B, the referendum project update, and there's none for this month. Um, and then moving on to item C, um, the presentation from our Neola representative, Dr. Um, Scott Brown. All right. <laughs> sure, yes, yeah, you can. Hey. Yep, yep, Hugh here. Mr. Miller, help yep. out there, yeah. Slideshow. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Scott Brown. I work for Neola. I've worked for them for seven years. I'm the retired superintendent from McFarland, Wisconsin, where I served as superintendent and uh, director of finance there. And uh, also have been involved with um, uh, training superintendents across the state. Uh, running the Edgewood College Superintendent Training Program. Um, I'm here to share with you just a little bit about uh, about Neola, just to give you more information about it in particular, and um, hopefully answer any questions that anyone here has about what we do. Uh, Neola is a policy services company. Um, it it uh, provides policy services for school districts, and. Uh, I joined, I joined NEOLA actually after hearing about it as a superintendent when I was training and getting my license. I was interested as, as a business manager because we were spending a lot of money on school policy. We would get samples um, from other districts, from WSB, and then from there we would uh, 
uh, draft policy ourselves as administrators, and then we would send it on to our attorney, who at the time was Mike Jelka. And we were probably spending about, and this would have been quite a few years ago, about $20,000 a year on policy work in addition to the administrative time. So when I became superintendent, I was just interested in, in what they were offering. Um, at that point, I think they had around 70 districts in the state, and we ended up joining them, and I had a, a very, very good experience with them. And when the opportunity came to talk about them, I was already presenting uh, in my finance classes for school business managers and my superintendent training. I was presenting sort of a variety of things that I'd bumped into over the years that I thought would be good for anyone going in to know about, but my intent wasn't at that point. I never thought I'd be working for NEOLA. So just to give you a little bit of background on NEOLA, it started um, uh, 40 years ago. It started in the state of Ohio, and then since then they've added a few states on. Uh, they pretty much have had the same uh, six states that they serve for around the last 30 years. So they aren't targeting to try to be a policy service provider across the entire country or anything like that. The company was started by a school superintendent who saw a need and thought that he had some ideas on how it could be met. Um, it, it really is cooperative uh, policy development. It works a lot like a CISA in a way, if I could compare it to that. It's uh, really, it, it, it allows many districts to all get the legal support from two leading law firms in the state and, uh, and be able to sort of combine that work so it's a lot less expensive. Right now, annually, uh, you would be paying NEOLA around $3,400 a, a year for two policy updates. Um, the more expensive part of NEOLA is when you join them and you draft all those policies. Um, and with that, you have an associate like myself come to the district, um, present the policy updates, either to the superintendent, administrative team, sometimes policy committee, sometimes to the entire board. And the policies are, are updated on a regular basis and they're updated across the entire uh, policy spectrum. When we do an update, it takes a look at all your policies in your entire book. Um, we now have about 1,600 clients in six states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, Indiana. You can see the states there. Um, like I said, we've been in Wisconsin about 30 years. We have 10 offices. By that, I mean we also have 10 associates, so all of us have an office that we work out of, uh, usually in our home. Um, uh, the policies are all Wisconsin-specific. Um, they involve... Uh, recommendations from superintendents, recommendations from the attorneys we work with, um, and they all are approved ultimately by uh, either the law firm of Amitz and Davis um, and uh, Running Lewis and Lacey. Um, and then most recently, Running Lewis and Lacey, one of the lead attorneys from Boardman Clark, which is another big law firm, Tess O'Brien, joined that firm. So we probably represent, with the attorneys we have, maybe 70% uh, of the school districts in the state uh, are involved with the, with the legal teams that we use. And then we also have staff counsel at NEOLA, and we have national attorneys that work on the policies like non-discrimination, Title IX, um, uh, anything to do um, with where you might tie into the, to, to federal law. We have national attorneys that help prepare those, but then the state attorneys still look at those as well. So we really have this, this team of NEOLA. We use board docs, obviously. Board docs has created a NEOLA-specific platform for our policies that creates some good, way of, good ways of tracking and um, producing new policy. Uh, we, um, we literally, with any school district, can show them what they originally drafted, any changes they've made, over the years with every update, we store all that material for you. In addition, uh, NEOLA, when you update a policy, uh, it's all done for you by NEOLA production. So we alert them that your policies have now been approved and updated. It goes to NEOLA production, and then they write back and say that the policies have been active, are now active, the old policies have been retired, 
and the work that you did related to that has been archived. So uh, we feel like we're really um, sort of a, a top to bottom policy provider. Um, you get the, the have to have an associate that works with you very personally, that understands and knows your policies, that uh, has been a former superintendent, so they have a, a good idea of um, the type of things that you all face and you all do in both the, on the board and in the administrative role. We're currently out of 425 districts in the state. We're in 330. We've increased 220 districts since 2013. When I started with Neola, I had 13 clients. Uh, and um, in, I think, six years, I added, I added about, I think, about 50 clients, just myself, during that time. So Neola's really been growing. We generally don't advertise, don't send mailers out. It's all word of mouth. A couple of the places where I've worked, we've worked with one district, and then just from that initial work, we end up having like the whole group, um, the whole group of maybe like a CISA or an athletic conference that will end up going with Neola just based on a client experience. The good reason to use us is that we save administrative time. We should be saving you costs as well. We have a very systematic and a proactive process. When something happens, like a Title IX change, maybe maybe with uh, um, the different uh, the different um, uh, presidents, they've both made changes. So the new Title IX is about to come out under President Biden. The old Title IX came out under President Tr uh, President Trump. In addition to our regular updates, we'll do a special update to make sure that you have that policy in place. Uh, same way with COVID, I think we had six different updates, offering boards various choices on how to handle everything from conducting board meetings virtually to, um, to uh, precautions as far as health and safety of students as well. Um, we are up to date on like the state and federal law changes. So for instance, maybe you receive information from the National School Board Association or the Wisconsin Association of School Boards or the District, Asso the, the District Administrators Association or the School Business Manager Association, a lot of times those would float in before our district went with NEOLA and we wonder whether that policy was going to be updated because we were just reading about it in our, in our own trade area. But uh, rest assured, if there's a policy that needs to be updated legally, it will come through and it will come through before you uh, have to have it in place. Um, we, hear at the, we hear at the conference, the state conference, we're there every year. The thing we hear most from school boards is that they just have a peace of mind because they know that one of their great responsibilities is to produce policy and they know it's going to be done and done right and they have less concerns about that. Uh, I'm, I'm a lacrosse boy myself, that's where I grew up. And if you've ever been to lacrosse, anybody here been to lacrosse along the way? <laughs> anybody had been to Schmitty Supper Club? Anybody heard of that? Well, it was about two blocks down from my house, and we would go there for fish fry. And uh, my dad, um, we'd go there, but we'd always take something to do because it was a typical, you know, well-regarded fish fry restaurant. It still, it still is today. So we'd have to wait out in the parking lot, you know, for our, for our seats sometimes, you know, like, like we often have to do for fish fry night. And uh, we would kind of bug my dad and say, can't we just go somewhere where we can get food? Why do we have to wait for this? And my dad said, you always want to eat where the cars are parked outside. You go to a town and it's five o'clock and you see a restaurant and there's nobody parked there. You might be a little bit nervous, you know, about whether that's the place you want to go. I think Neola's the same way. I mean, the cars are parked outside uh, our work. It's where people are, are joining. I don't know that we've ever lost a client that signed up for us in the history of all our years in Wisconsin. Um, and we continue to add, add clients literally, I would say, um, a couple every month. Uh, and in most states where we're at, um, the majority, the vast majority of school districts use our services. So it's consistent across all the states that we're at. So the benefits for all of you is you are assured compliance. You get the experience of all the other districts. Amazingly, one thing I learned when I joined Neola is that a lot of the way, ways our policy change 
are based on the experience of other districts that then share that in the update meetings that we do to plan the next update. And as a result, I think our policies are constantly improving across the entire NEOLA client group. You're going to have a local and district policy manual. Most districts have a number of policies that are their own. They don't necessarily uh, use all of NEOLA templates. Examples might be how you rent your facilities or um, uh, parking rules and all, all sorts of things like that. So it's pretty not unusual for districts to have some of their own local policies as well. Um, and uh, that works very well. We update, our, we update our policies, guidelines, and forms twice a year. The update just came out, as a matter of fact, at the very end of this year. And the suggestions for our update come from national and state uh, ba uh, based legal counsel. Suggested changes from clients and associates, we have the opportunity to put in what some things that we think might need to be changed. And then we always be doing special updates as well. So it's a systematic process to keep current. You get the personal um, attention of someone who will come out here at every update, explain, and have had been at the meeting when the update was discussed, you know, the rationale for the update from that person. You also get um, the opportunity for the board to review and look it over and approve. And none of the policies are alike among our districts. The policies are filled with different choices depending on how you want to interpret um, uh, or what emphasis you want to put in your policy. So we try to make them not, um, unless it needs to be that way, we try to offer districts choices in different directions they might want to go. And then we automatically update your website. So I won't uh, read through this, it just sort of again emphasizes what, um, you know, what NEOLA is about. We have about 400 legally vetted policy templates and uh, we make every effort to try to make sure our customers are satisf satisfied. I'm kind of an example of, of that. The associate that you had um, before was hired as the uh, president of a community college up north. And um, now I'm covering for him as we train two new associates to, to take over a number of his districts. So um, for me, it was not hard. It was uh, something I thought was very important. If you wanted to talk to your NEOLA rep or a NEOLA rep, um, it, 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 it was, it's going to be about an eight-hour round trip, but it's important. And policies are very important as well. Um, NEOLA will also provide legal assistance if your policy is challenged. We will provide it um, unless you, know, you kind of go free solo and uh, decide to maybe do a little legal work on your own. But as far as what we produce, we'll stand behind you if there's a legal challenge um, uh, as a part of a question about a policy. And obviously over the years, there have been questions mm -hmm. and we've had to sometimes have our attorneys who help write the policies, help in that case and assist you along the way. As I mentioned, you've been a, it costs about $3,400 a year, that's what you pay. If you were a new client signing up just for the drafting, it's about $17,000. So that's what it costs to get into NEOLA. It's the same price across all the districts we serve. I had a district of 65, a K-8 in the Lake Geneva area, and I had Madison. So it, uh, they all, in essence, uh, pay the same Price, including you along the way. You drafted a while back, so it certainly was less expensive, but you've done the hard part, and that's redraft, reorganize all your policies. So I think that's important. Um, I wanted to touch on questions we get fairly often, which is about, you know, are we political or politically affiliated? Founding principle, I'll just read this, is that made Neola such a reliable and reputable service for school board policy is its commitment to incorporating established legal concepts into policy templates. NEOLA does not issue policies advanced, advancing unsettled legal theories or partisan positions on socially controversial issues. Um, we have uh, stayed out of any gender areas that aren't, um, or gender or gender identity areas that aren't clearly settled law. 
following both the local uh, courts and then the <coughs> district courts of the United States. However, if something becomes settled, uh, we will bring it to your attention and make sure you, you know about it. Some examples, um, uh, student publications. We have a policy in student publications. It gives you the full broad legal range that you have in terms of monitoring, uh, like if you had a school newspaper, monitoring it. On the one hand, we had a district uh, that had um, someone who was very concerned that the students' rights for free speech were being withheld in our policy. And we showed them that, that the choices that were made were made by the district under what was allowed by law. Now recently, there's, a legisl there's legislation going through that's pushed by the, the student uh, um, newspaper, it's a, it's a national organization and they're working with different state legislators and they've even you know, asked us uh, a, as well uh, questions about um, our current policy and what the background is, so we have a rich discussion with them. But there's a good chance that policy will have to change because the law is going to change. And uh, whether we think that's good or not, we're going to just follow the law. Human growth and development, districts have options to make choices under that, and some people uh, read what we have, which is really out of the statute. It almost strictly follows the statute in every, in every way, but people disagree with what the statute says. Um, and they, sometimes they want to change it, and we recommend that they follow exactly what the statute says, even if it doesn't align with their own personal feelings on that topic. Um, Neola has made an effort to change its pronouns, and that's you know been met with questions. We haven't and we change them in all our states because it's really a national legal issue. It's not necessarily a state legal issue. Um, we haven't had uh, anyone leave our um, leave Neola over it, but we do have some options for people. If they are concerned about it. The rationale for doing it is that um, we think that if you if if you use pronouns like he she in board policy, in particular board policies that have the federal statute against uh, uh, gender discrimination, which includes gender identity, that if you have a case that happens in your school district, um, it, it doesn't necessarily, we don't think it would bode well that you made no effort in your policies to acknowledge this as something that might be seen as discriminatory. So that's the rationale. What we're doing to work around it is, um, uh, because it's, I think it's uncomfortable at times for people to, to deal uh, with that issue and the, and the way it reads, using the pronoun they instead of their. Neola's moved more towards just using the, using the nouns, so they'll rewrite the sentence. A number, number of my districts have done that. Every time a policy comes out, a new policy, they've just said, um, like the district administrator again, rather than referring to the pronouns. So. That would, as far as we're concerned, um, be better than, uh, ne than keeping uh, the gender-specific pronouns in. The other thing that's kind of interesting, when Neola first started, the only pronouns they used were he. So um, over time, they went to he, she, because he was used more you know, generally, um, and that was what they changed back then, and I talked to um, one of the sort of the founders of the company, she's retired, and she uh, said that that was controversial when they did that. There were people that thought that that was in some way heading in the wrong direction. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Hopefully I covered the type of things that you would have, a, have an interest in hearing as well as getting a better idea about our company and what we're up to. In your opinion, what makes Neola different than other policy providers like WASB and others? I know there are several that yeah. I, sets I'm, you apart that yeah, you do differently. That's a good question. I mean, I think, um, uh, I mean, I've a couple times presented, you know, at the same time as WASB, so I've had a chance to see, you know, what they what they do. And I come from a district that was a WASB client, so um, I, I don't, I don't like, um, 
I don't like to talk about their program. I'll focus on mine, but I'll tell you what I think are strengths. You won't have um, a personal service like you have with Neola. You won't have a rep that will come out. Um, WASB works with law firms as well, but they have their own legal group. I think our attorneys all work with districts and school boards, so they're, they're really wrapped up in the actual like day-to-day -day operations, so that might be something that differentiates, differentiates us a little bit. Um, the service we provide, production, to store, to update your policies, to archive your policies, those will all be things you'd have to do, for, do by yourself, I believe. So I think that's another, uh, another difference. Um, I think, you know, uh, there's strength in numbers. You know, nobody likes to be the only school that doesn't call a snow day on a bad day or is the only one who calls a snow day, right? If you're a superintendent, that was your greatest fear. That you would be the only district, in my case, in sort of the Dane County area, I'd be the only district that would be open or closed because you're going to get tons of calls from the press and things like that. I mean, you basically have, with Neola, 330 districts that have similar, similar policies to you. So I think there's a lot of good input that comes, but there's also a lot of safety in knowing that you aren't stepping out on a limb. Um, because we're all sort of uh, building off the same templates, which I think is a, a strength. When you say you use you use attorneys across the six states, apparently, right? I mean, right. But, right. But I don't, and I don't feel like Wasby would use a, I imagine just Wisconsin attorneys that are. Yeah, all we use is general. for for Wisconsin. All we use is Wisconsin attorneys. You do right, and those attorneys represent. I think with the new change of, with Tess and Brian moving from Boardman and Clark, I would say our attorneys and those law firms likely serve seventy to eighty percent of the districts in the state. But we don't use any like like. Uh, I'll give you a really actually a really kind of practical example. So recently, um, uh, during COVID, the owner of the company passed away. So his daughter has taken it over. She was working with the company uh, and has done an excellent job. One of the things that, that has come up recently is that I've taken a new position with the company, which is uh, director of uh, administrative services, kind of going with my school finance background and then also hopefully you know the, the background I had as a superintendent. So I was honored to be asked to do this job, so I'm full-time with Neola <laughs> um, now. But now I see the bills. and. Uh, I could estimate pretty well that Neola spends in each state with different law firms in excess of $100,000 of legal work that we pay for, for these law firms to produce the product that we bring to you in each state. And that's something that no individual district could probably ever uh, afford, but you can afford it because you're, you're, you're all paying for it as a group, like a CISA. To get um, to be able to get that service, so that's um, that's kind of how it, you know what, what I've seen how it works. I got a couple more questions, but I'll let somebody else ask. Yeah, one. does anyone else have a question here? Anyone else from the board um, at all? Um, go ahead, Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so just recently, as you talked about changing pronouns to nouns, and you said there are options there. My question is. If we chose not to change those two nouns and left them he, she, is Neola still, would Neola still legally cover if we left that as is? I mean, if there was a, I mean, I, I, I'm not an attorney, but I, here's, what I would, here's what I would say. If there was a case that involved gender identity or something related to that, and you're having someone, you know, accuse the district or in, or in some way, and it came, you know, as a part of whenever something goes sideways, everybody goes to their board policy, right? So you might have an attorney representing a student or parents. You might have an attorney, private attorney representing you. If as a part of that, you know, that process, you were critiqued or part of the things they were considering was, uh, if your policies demonstrated an effort to acknowledge that and you chose to do he, she when, um, 
when uh, they would uh, clearly show that you're demonstrating, you know, uh, an effort, then they maybe Neola would say, well, you made that choice, and that's fine. You, you wouldn't be the only district to make that choice. We, we aren't going to force it on anyone. These are your policies. You can do it. But uh, we, we just want to be able to at least answer the question on why, why we're doing it across our states. And it might even, there might be a, you know, a court case someday that changes it in a, in a different direction. But for right now, this is what I think both the national attorneys and our, uh, our state attorneys, the ones that we work with in Wisconsin, uh, feel is the right thing to do. So to follow up with that, I think if I heard you right, you said that if you didn't want to go that way, there was you had uh, there's options there or did well, I hear I that mean, right? Well, what we've been doing as associates is so when it when a change comes out, first of all, as we're drafting the policies, like at first when we drafted them, we just changed the pronouns to they. Now when we draft them, we tend to just repeat the noun, just to you know just to still meet what we think is important, but yet um, uh, but yet offer districts, you know, a choice. Then other districts have said to the Neola rep, I want you to I want you to change that pronoun to whatever noun it's referring to. Because usually the noun starts somewhere in a paragraph and then the pronouns will be in, a, in the next sentence, maybe or maybe later on in that sentence. So if we're referring to the district administrator and the policy said later he, later on he she should do this, we're just going to say the district administrator is, it needs to do this. We're going to repeat the same noun without getting into a descriptive pronoun. Um, so I mean that, that's that's something that when you know an, an update comes out, it, it's not hard to do. You can you could have someone administratively do that if you feel that's important as a board. Um, but uh, there are options. I, I wouldn't say you, you're without options on on that topic. Thank you. Any um, other board member? Oh, you go ahead yeah. real quick, and then we'll get to the. Okay. Well, I just Michelle have, had her hand up real quick. Joe. Sorry. Yep. Just one question. Out of the 330 districts in Wisconsin, how many have changed it to he, she, and how many have changed it to the noun? I mean, I, I don't really have that data, but I can tell you that I know probably at least 10 districts that have done something different than what we've provided to them. And I know there's at least two districts that have just kept he, she. Do you, I know you're not an attorney, but do you have any idea how many legal challenges have challenged pronoun changes over I, your six states? No. In I've, particular, Wisconsin? Yeah. I mean, like. Was this actually been a factor or something's happened with this? Uh, I don't know. I mean, Neil was pretty proactive. I mean, I, I don't think they, I think when they felt it had to change, they made a decision to change it um, I don't I don't know of any okay. of any challenge okay and we had a question from the audience if you could come up please um, and uh. hey, John, my name is John Hedlund I live here in the district I'm running for school board this spring um, I just want to put myself on the map here with a question for you I appreciate your background in finance and uh, as a school school superintendent uh, we used to play hockey against McFarland, so not right. unfamiliar with you guys. Um, and then we would have them stay overnight at our houses. Oh, that's so awesome. I actually got to know some of those guys. Um, I'm a heating and cooling guy. I like to deal with hard data. I like to look at what science is actually proving for how much heat it takes to heat a house or how much cooling <laughs> it takes uh, to make something comfortable for people. And, and there's some pretty good science that engineers can look at stuff and say this is what it is and this is what it isn't. Someone can argue with me about uh, insulation values or how good their windows are, but uh, science can really show some things. Right. And so for me, it's confusing to see our society as a whole start to argue with all of these things about gender identity. And you mentioned uh, showing effort to be inclusive towards all genders is what I'm assuming you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I have yet to hear of any solid scientific evidence to show that there are any other genders besides male and female. So when you say showing effort to be inclusive of all genders, I think he, she does a pretty good job of that. Um, could you explain to me why, why are we losing our minds? 
Oh, Why I, would we go somewhere yeah, besides he and she? Yeah, I don't have Thanks. a. Yeah, I don't know that I have a good answer. I can, you know, I can just tell you that, uh, you know, in federal law, this is where they've landed. Uh, you know, in the in the in the non discrimination statements that they write. I mean, they write gender, gender identity. There are actually are a couple different, you know, non discrimination statements that districts are required to to have. Um, I certainly, you know, I understand, understand how you see this because um, there's certainly a lot of people that see it that way. But um, I kind of have to pull myself back in this case and just say this is what we are told is what we should do in policy. And, and there have been a few districts, I think even like in a more risky area, have said, we're not going to put in the federal or Wisconsin non-discrimination statement in our policy, or we're going to cut parts of it out, the ones that we don't think fit. But I think that's kind of going down uh, you know, a dangerous road in terms of uh, choices you make and what it might cost your district if something goes sideways. But um, uh, you know, I'm really glad I'm not you know, running for congressman and have you come up and ask that question, because it would be just, it would be a, <laughs> A different answer, but that's the new old answer. Okay, so please come up to the microphone, please. Yep. Uh, Andrew Melton. Um, again, I appreciate you being here, Scott, and does sound like uh, you guys have done a lot of work for the district and other districts, and appreciate that. Um, I did have a couple of questions just on the cost because mm -hmm. um, it was mentioned that it's thirty four hundred for two updates a year. Mm -hmm. um, it, what is what is the plan for the district here? How many updates this year? Yeah, so everyone for thirty four hundred dollars gets uh, gets two updates. They they bill them at two seventeen hundred dollar increments when the update comes out, and that's all any district will have. All the special updates, like when something comes up where Neola has to add, uh, is just something that Neola provides. They don't charge anything extra for that. Yeah. So the, in changing some of the pronouns, is that considered just one update? Yeah, uh, or is that separate that just, for each of these. Policies? No, no, it's just it's just a part of the whole, like the whole update. So Neola isn't going through, and changing like, the the pronouns proactively in terms of, like going through your entire policy book. When a policy gets updated, that's when they make that change. So, and it's just a part of the regular update. So, so as far as the district here, the plan was, with just doing two updates this year. Just that's that that's what every every, I mean there might be a special update coming out on Title IX, but as a, as a part of the old service you get two updates that update your entire policy book, um, throughout a year. So you get two updates a year. Everybody in, in the old does that. Okay, and then I think tonight was clarifying, which was good um, because we've had a couple of these meetings so far with the board, and it was stated by the board that um, these changes were not because of gender identity. Um, that they were changing them just because they were uh, no longer, well, words were used like it was just clunky or they weren't natural uh, written in there. And so it, it is clear then the reason why it's going this direction is because of gender identity cases throughout the country. Yeah, I'm, I, the one thing I'm not real good at is like, like all the terms they use related to gender, like gender identity, transgender, sort of all those things, but certainly those cases working their way through the courts have caused this this change. It, it's it's definitely not something that Neola um, like sought like sought to do like wanted to do necessarily, but correct. And I'm yeah, in agreement yeah. with that. And the community recognized that. But in my opinion, the board was trying to say something different. Okay. It didn't have anything to do with that. So I was glad that's clarified tonight. And so going to. Um, the statement that at one time was just he in there and eventually got changed to he, she. So some would say, well, this is just a natural progression then right. as our culture moves that direction. But like John had explained, he, she was maybe a good update and correct was that culture changes. But going from that to saying it's about identity and that there's now more than just male and female goes clearly against science. It, it's a big jump. It's not even in the same. It's, it's not even comparing the, the two 
same things. And um, some of those other questions I had here were answered about other districts not changing these, so we wouldn't be the only district that's not changing them. But I just want to give an illustration tonight of where I'm coming from and being a past teacher. So if I was teaching and there was a 10-year-old girl, say, at the lunchroom that wasn't eating lunch and is struggling with being anorexic, and she, uh, you go up and you're, you're saying, how are you doing, why aren't you eating stuff? She said, well, I'm fat, I'm not, I'm not going to eat. I, 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 I'm, I'm fat. I believe all of us here would say that it would be wrong for that teacher or any administrator to say, well, I, I'm in agreement with you. I'll help you in that. I see you as fat as well. Um, and here's, here's actually some things we could help with. Um, liposuction is a, a way to help with that. Here's a procedure that could help. Um, we would think that's crazy. Having this discussion about these changes, point out changes, I think all of us could agree that nobody here could say that that would have happened 10 years ago, that we didn't think that we'd be here tonight. That poor little girl needs some help. She's struggling. And it would be crazy for any teacher to, to do that. Or even, and, and we can't say, well, this won't happen, because there is districts struggling with some of these things and these issues that we're talking about that may happen. And so it'd be crazy to even go beyond that and say, well, we'll just keep this between you and I. We won't share with your parents that this is how you identify yourself. And these are things that are being discussed all over in our country today. And so if you do the same thing with a girl, a 10-year-old girl, a poor girl that says, I'm, I'm a boy or I identify as a boy, I'd say shame on us as educators. I'm not teaching anymore, but shame on us as educators if we don't come alongside that little girl and help her to say you need some help. and We'd like to get you some help because there is only two sexes, male and female. And we need to get them help. And I know this is a big discussion out there, but it clearly goes against science and what is helpful for these children. Now, if adults, once they get out of school and they want to discuss those changes and live that way, but we are educators here to protect children. And as a district, we need to do what's best for a district. And I know you're saying we're doing what's best for Neola. We need as a community to do what's best for this community and what's best for our children. And that's how I see it. Two. I got one question. Um, is there any other? Well, yeah, yeah, we have a gentleman here. In the, right. Another. Anyone else from the audience before Joe has another question? No problem. Take your time. So, if Spooner School District is involved in a lawsuit. Will Neola put an attorney in that courtroom or are they just an assist? Well, as I would say as an assist. I mean, generally when you have a lawsuit, you're, the first thing you engage is your insurance company who provides your attorney for you at their cost. So Neola would provide you know, a backup or would provide our attorney consultation at our expense, but it would be, it, it really, the, the person that he needs to represent you in a lawsuit is, is usually uh, your own counsel. Although what I learned in McFarland several times was uh, when you do get a lawsuit that is covered by you know, your, your school insurance, that insurance company doesn't always allow you to use the attorney you always use. They usually have someone they want to use, but, um, I think, you know, Neola would probably be involved in writing briefs, supplying information, being on consult um, to, to the person that would be the lead attorney in, in your school's case. So I guess what I'm hearing is that there's not going to be a money savings if this happens. This goes to court. Um, the other thing I did, I printed off a copy of a Wisconsin birth certificate. Sex, male, female, that's it. Okay. Yeah, sure, come on up. Hi, my 
Hemsville skid mark. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think very many of us would have an issue with a change in policy that went from he, she talking about the school superintendent to <coughs> school superintendent. That's common sense. Or he, she as a teacher to say teacher, or he, she as a student to say student. I don't think any of us would have an issue with that. The issue that I believe comes up and that really hasn't been addressed is what happens when a boy, a male, who is transgender as a girl wants to use the girl's locker room and the girl's bathroom? These are the issues that I think all of us here are kind of concerned about. I think that the teachers and the staff in Spooner are excellent. I think they're very well educated. I think they're compassionate and kind. And I think that if they see a student who's transgender, they're not gonna run up to him, point their finger in their face and say, you're gonna go to hell. I would certainly hope they wouldn't. <clears throat> I don't think we need a rule that says you have to call this person a they, okay? I think that we haven't had a problem that I've heard of so far, and I know we have transgender kids. I understand that, and like I say, I think people are pretty compassionate to know that as an adolescent, kids go through a lot of things when they're young, and you know um, they don't need to be condemned they do need to be helped. But again, the issue, in my opinion, is bathrooms, locker rooms. OK. The other side of that coin is, what defines a transgender? Is there any statute, a psychological report that says, OK, this person is a transgender. In other words, if I say, OK, I identify right now as a woman, do you have to treat me as a woman? Legally? Um, I mean, as far as like what I know about this is that a lot of the areas that like you talked about with, with bathrooms, et cetera, is unsettled law, so Neola doesn't touch it. Mm -hmm. A lot of our districts want something because they're, they're having just as many people sometimes go out very passionate, feeling a completely different way, and that's part of public education, right? It's representing how your community feels, getting feedback like you provided today. But Neola is not, like, we don't, we don't discuss the, the science behind it or, uh, you know anything like that all we try to do is provide like good like legal counsel and and I, I would just I would add it wouldn't be unusual for a district to you know on some of these matters to, to talk to their own legal counsel they work with along mm -hmm. the way and maybe they would give you know a different a, a different opinion but uh, obviously I'm I'm not here representing like either side of okay. the of the argument, so I, I don't I, I'm not I'm not uh, able to respond, you know, to that. Really. This is the gray area that we're dealing with right now. Is kids are going to be confused? Kids are going to feel like I'm not right. This and that. We need to be compassionate and help them. We also have to understand we have to protect the students, all of the students, not just the depending on which. Uh, data you look at uh, between 1% and 5% of, of students identify as transgender, we have to look at the 95% as well. And what's going to protect them from someone deciding, hey, I want to go in the girls' locker room today. Teacher, I'm transgender. I'm a girl today. I want to walk in the bathroom. I think that this is such a gray area. We have to be very, very, very careful about passing any kind of, of rules, regulations, or statutes 
that will prevent us from protecting the children. That's my concern. That's my concern is the protection of all the children. Uh, we've all heard stories on the news of bad things that have happened. Um, and in a small school district like this, I would rather trust the teachers to be compassionate and deal with the issues on a one-on-one -on -one basis rather than have a blanket policy that says this is what you have to do. My daughter-in-law is a, uh, a, a teacher's union president in Minnesota. They just went through this same thing. And they decided they did not want it because they felt that it would hinder their ability to make those decisions. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, yeah, any other questions concerning this presentation? Yep. I Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, I understand your position. I understand. Uh, I'm glad you clarified the reason for these changes was a political decision rather than a wordsmithing decision because it's clunky language. It, it, it was a politically motivated uh, change. No, it was a legal change. It was, well, it was based on lawyers saying school districts should make this change based on cases that had gone through. It wasn't, I mean, I, you know, Neola reps and people in the company. You know, we don't we don't get into politics. We don't we don't we just all. Well, we that's that's my question. You you talk about not issuing policies advancing unsettled legal theories, such as pronouns. Yet you went ahead and changed the pronouns, which basically divides communities because half the people think one way and half the other. If we had just left it the way it was, I don't think anybody would care because nobody reads those policies anyway. You know, I, realistically, that's true. I mean, so we're arguing about a, a couple of words in a school policy that, but you guys brought it up. So I mean, that's, my, that's the problem I have with it. I, I don't think it should have been brought up as a change at all, because that just creates all this confusion I mean, and conflict. The discussion when, because I was there when Neola started to change them, was exactly what you said, which was there will be communities that will be upset at this. But we aren't, like our mission for our company is not to make decisions based on what people want, okay? We base it on what we think is good legal counsel. And I think since then we've come up, come up with a pretty good alternative. Get rid of the pronouns, use nouns. You can, it's not hard I to do. I think that's probably a, an option. Right, for sure. I mean, I could, yeah. I could go back home and in four hours find every place you have the word they and change it to a pronoun and the board could pass it tomorrow and you would be fine. And the attorneys appear to be comfortable with that. And that's why I think you'll see in the updates that are coming out, I mean, if the initial updates were just blanket substituting he, she, for they, and there. But I've, I've noticed that. And yeah, the recent but, ones you've put right, out, they but, do have nouns instead of they and right, they. Right, right. And, and in the latest update, it's like that as, as well. So, um, but I don't, I don't, I, I just really want to emphasize that um, there's, I mean, you know, I, I was a school superintendent, so. You know, meetings like this aren't unusual, and people have very strongly felt opinions. And if you live in Dane County, you end up with it right down the middle when they want to come and present. And that's even more difficult because there's a lot of passion, a lot of passion on both sides of things. At least in, in this group, you all seem, you know, fairly unified and have similar concerns, which, you know, what reflects your community and reflects your board. But um, that. The motivation on the old staff is not, we, we get asked literally probably 20 times last year, I got asked for something, some policy that would deal with the gender questions about bathrooms and locker rooms and everything else. And uh, the response we got was just, you couldn't, you couldn't put anything in there because it's unsettled law. It just has, it's got to work, cases have to happen, they have to work their way through the courts. Court decides, eventually it usually stops at the circuit court, it doesn't go to the Supreme Court. Once that case is decided, Neola will try to craft something that meets that law. 
So it's, um, it, you know, uh, I feel bad. I feel bad that this puts you in a difficult position. I, you know, I think hindsight probably in my mind would have been coming up with the idea of, you know, looking at options and policies that you would just use nouns because the, the, that would probably have worked better initially. We haven't had, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be frank here, we haven't had a lot of, of, a lot of feedback on this. Now, it might be what you said, nobody knows their policies anyway and they don't read them, right? So, and, and maybe it just came to light more <coughs> in this community and that raised a lot more concern. But it hasn't been, you know, a, it hasn't been a burning issue, but we have gotten feedback from the associates that have said, you know, districts want some type of alternative because they aren't comfortable with this, what can we do? So we're trying to do it and still have our attorneys go, that's okay. So my clarifying question would be, so as of right now, it's not actually um, a legal change that has to happen. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's recommended by NEOLA, but we don't make anyone, be, we, you know, they're your policies. If, if, you don't wanna, if you don't wanna do it, you don't have to do it. You don't have right. to change them, or you could change them in a different way. So as of right now, it's, it's not something that legally has to be changed. So it is possible for the district to wait until the court cases go through. No, I'm ta when I said that, I was talking about things like, like bathrooms and locker rooms and, and sports. All those things are unsettled. And the old doesn't have a policy on any of them. Correct. But, but, but the pronoun change still is not a legal case either. They don't legally have to change that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the rationale for the pronoun case is that you, in multiple areas, or this district, in multiple areas, have in your policy that you will not discriminate against uh, you know, transgender, gender identity, and that's based on the non-discrimination statements that you are told, taking federal money, and in some cases, state money that come, that's federal through the, comes from the feds through, you know, DPI in Wisconsin, uh, you, you, are, you are stating that you, that you don't discriminate. And the argument uh, legally is that by having he, she in your policies, you don't acknowledge these gender issues that you, and, you know, and I, I certainly understand the uh, the other side of that coin, and I think I know a lot of people do. We don't want it to divide a community. And again, I, I would say the easy choice for Neola would have been not to do it. it there, there's nothing, absolutely nothing to be gained for our company. But they did it across all six states. And overall, you know, there have been some meetings like this, I'm sure in other states, but, um, you know, I think Neola's really position is if, if, if we feel legally we should do this based on, um, you know, based on how it matches up with what you say in your non-discrimination that you don't discriminate against, it's probably something that they felt strong enough that they were just gonna do it, so. Okay, thanks again, yeah. Scott, for clarifying. Yeah. I so, appreciate it. Um, okay, was there any other um, questions at this time? What? Sure, yep. Yeah. Quick question. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I don't wanna keep everybody. Um, the, okay, let's say we adopted this like you're recommending. What does that do to the school? I know, okay, it's policy, right? Say we adopted this policy, um, just for an example. All right, what would the school look like that from then on? Is it, like Joe said, nobody reads the policy anyways. So, I would probably ask the school board this, I mean, or what would, you know, you could feed, or way in on it too, yeah, I mean, but how would this affect the school? Would we have to make new bathrooms? Do we have to have different locker rooms? No. I mean, would this cost us, you know, more money down the road just because we change this policy right now? You know, would that start, you know, lead to more things like this? So that would be my big question. Otherwise, you know, I really, I, I went to Spooner High School and I really appreciate, you know, it's, it's been here for 100 years, the Spooner Schools. It's a good school and it's a good community. So we're all concerned about these things. You know, yeah. We don't it, want this to be a big problem or I mean, you know, all, lead to things. There's so, nothing, but anyways. Yeah, there's nothing by adopting these policies that 
should change any of the things that you mentioned because they aren't mentioned. And, it, and it, it's really, I mean, you, you, you just kind of feel bad for the schools that are, you know, starting to go through lawsuits from people who have feel that they were discriminated against, right? That, that is happening in several areas in our state right now, mm -hmm. in our districts. And it's, it's over things like bathrooms and locker rooms and, you know, some of those, uh, uh, and parental right of notification. I mean, I, I know you're a former teacher, but I'll tell you what, these, these teachers are put in really, really tough situations. I mean, it's not a, it's not, it's change. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of stuck in the middle, you know, of a lot of things. So. At this point, there's no subtle law. You just hope that, you know, if something comes down your way that way, you have to try to, you know, get your own legal counsel and figure out how to how to handle that at this point, as far as my understanding from the meetings that we go to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just real quick, I just can you clarify? You said so now Neola is going forward with their suggestion is to be student staff as of, or whatever the no no neola neola isn't isn't doing anything concerning gender correct except changing it there's nothing there's right. nothing there's nothing else that we're doing i think i think we have like a legal document we got so many districts that are right in the middle of this you know like they're in the middle of parents on both sides we put together a document that can sort of guide a district on what the talking points are and what Fair. to try to try to figure out some solution, but um, I think it's uh, it's it's something that you know it m maybe it's hitting more you know of the southern part of the state, but it seems like eventually we're going to have to have some answers uh, either legislatively, you know, or legal cases or something to determine this. I I appreciate you being here and fielding all these questions. I think. You know, by going to student, let's say we went to student, but yet we have boys on the bathroom, boys locker room. I mean, just logically, that's where it's gonna, that's where it has to go because then how do you prove that you're not discriminating? Then if I say I'm a, today, because we'd have to call that a student bathroom if we we're to keep going down that logic. So then that, that opens a Pandora's box it, that opens up another door. I don't see how eventually you, you're going to get challenged no matter what you do. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think the what ifs are all, you know, are all known. You just don't know. I'm going to tell you a quick, a quick story. So, obviously, in non-discrimination statements, you can't discriminate against someone who's handicapped, correct? And in McFarland, we had an older building, and <clears throat> we had a particular student, um, a feeding tube in a chair, full-time aid um, that, <clears throat> that we serve. A lot, a lot of folks don't realize that school districts, some of the, some of the kids we serve, we, we spend $100,000 on just for that student because they deserve the exact same education and opportunity. It's not, you know, things changed over time in terms of what was done in society with that student. So because we had this, this step issue um, in the front, we didn't have a way to get, uh, to get that student up there. We had a flat area right in back in the kitchen, and we we brought um, the student in that way. It was it worked out perfect. The van, you know, dropped her off. The aide would meet her, um, but we got sued because the parent felt <clears throat> that that girl deserved to be able to enter the building with all the other students. Uh, and, and and frankly. It didn't matter that she was severely cognitively impaired or anything else. So we spent, I don't know, it probably was close to 100000 revamping that building so that that, that student could, could enter. But when that building was built, people just didn't think the same way, right, about that type of thing? They didn't, it wasn't, but, but over time, the laws on discriminating Relating to handicaps led to you know every bathroom having a special stall for the most part. It it led to you know all sorts of things. So I don't know where this all leads. I, it maybe it just kind of goes away. Maybe a lot of laws are passed you know that that clarify it. I, I just did the update for Florida, and Florida has like a lot 
uh, I mean, they, they do a lot more to control our school and to give the board clear guidance on what they expect under the law. I'm very, you know, very, it, 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 it was very interesting to see the difference. So I don't know, I don't know where this is going necessarily. I don't, I think I have a good answer for you, but the, the, you don't, you probably won't deal with it until somebody raises an issue, you know, they may already have raised issues, but when somebody raises an issue legally, then you have to, you know, you have to figure out, talk to an attorney, find out where the law is, and then figure it out. And sometimes you might have to do things that you don't want to do, but that's, that's, you know, that's, um, so that's just how it, it works. You aren't, you aren't all powerful. There's, you know, there's laws that regulate what you can do. There's state laws and federal laws. All right. Um, one, yes, last question. You said something a few minutes back. Uh, you, you said that our exposure comes from policies that we've got that are there because of federal money that's coming our way. Is that, is that exclusively yeah, well, the exposure right now, is that we have to have a policy well, saying I mean, we won't discriminate yeah, I, I would because say, we're getting federal money? Um, I, I can't say that. I can, I can say this, that as a, you know, as a public like, institution, you know, as a, this, is a, this, is, you know, this whole thing is run by, obviously, state, federal, and local taxes. Yeah. Um, the, the, the state and the feds provide to you like what non-discrimination statement you're supposed to have. So um, I don't know if they would take your you know, money away or what they would do. What happened, what we see happen is they get, like the food service audit has a particular non-discrimination statement. You get audited in this district, I think every three or five years for food service. They come in, they do a write-up, and they say you need to change your, you know, your policy to this. So it deals with the wellness policy that's under food service, and that, that's what pays, you know, for a lot of all your school lunches. Yep. So there's certainly, I mean, certainly there is a side that, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't base it entirely on, you know, where the money comes in because I, I suspect that you have to not discriminate just based on case law beyond any money that would flow into your district from the feds or, or Wisconsin. All right. Thank you. It's broader than uh, just. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thanks so. Thank you. Um, thank you again for coming. Welcome. We appreciate it um, and the time that you spent with us. So thank you. Um, thank you. We, without any further questions. Thank you all for coming. Just for the audience's information, we will have, um, they could not be here this evening. They'll be here next meeting for, we'll have a presentation from WASB. The other, next committee. Next the committee, whole, a whole meeting. Yeah. Sorry, not this month. It'll be next month. Next committee, the whole meeting. We'll have another presentation from a representative from WASB as well. So, <clears throat> moving on to um, then, we are on now um, item D. Um, discuss the SMS school based mental health services. And Ms. Bella, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So wanted to talk with you this evening about um, an additional service that we have an opportunity to provide our students at the middle school, <clears throat> share with you some information about what that would look like and ask you to consider approval for that service. I'm gonna try to move this over. <coughs> All right, so um, we at the middle school had established a partnership with Washburn County Health and Human Services Department and Northwest Passage. Um, to provide mental health services to our students for one day per week. Um, given the amount of time that they would be on site, we determined that they would be able to see up to five students every other week, so 10 students total on their caseload. Um, their time spent at the middle school <clears throat> would include about um, 30 minutes of consultation with appropriate staff, likely myself, um, but any other relevant staff working with the students um, that they serve as well as contact with parents or guardians as needed, and then time for documentation of services. <clears throat> um, Washburn County Health and Human Services Department will utilize grant funding to cover the cost of the school-based services for the students. The funding source will be available for up to five years and paid for by Washburn County to Northwest Passage directly. Um, so we don't have a role in payment for the service. Um, it's free to us as long as we offer the space. Um, and support the service provided. 
The goal, the long-term goal, is to determine a plan, um, likely with these partners and the district, um, by the end of year five to continue it as a standard practice. So we'll have um, a solid five years to evaluate the program and look to see what funding looks like down the road um, for some sustainability planning beyond that five years. <clears throat> Um, the services by Northwest Passage will not replace existing partnerships with community-based mental health providers. So we currently do have MOUs in place to allow providers to come into the building and work with our students. Um, we don't have a lot of them coming in, but it will not replace the existing partnerships that we have with them. So the students who are currently seeing providers in our building will not have to switch over. It won't um, <coughs> replace any of that. Continuation of services during school breaks will be determined based on student need, provider availability, and the guardian preference. So we talked about what happens over summer break. That'll be something that will be determined a, as a case-by-case -case basis and will be under an agreement, a separate agreement, between Northwest Passage and Washburn County. We obviously will not um, have space for that within our building during those closed hours, so they'll <coughs> likely find an alternate site during that time should... Um, they agree that continuing to work with the students over that break is uh, necessary. Um, a referral process. So when a staff member has identified a potential need, the staff member would reach out to myself to share concerns. So if we have a teacher who's working with a student who says, I think they could really benefit from this, they would reach out to me um, <clears throat> and we would go through a referral process. I would evaluate the need based on collateral inf information that I likely know um, in my role within student services, things like office discipline referrals, absences, academic performances, and then access to other related services. So if they're a student who's already seeing um, a provider or maybe they're receiving services through other county programming, um, that would be taken into consideration when looking at um, who we feel can fill those um, limited spots that we have through this program. I would then contact the student's parent or guardian to share concerns and obtain permission to make the referral for school-based mental health services for the student, and then written consent would be obtained through our release of information. So ensuring that the parent is on board, getting written consent before I then reach out to Northwest Passage. Um, with consent from the student's guardian, I would submit the uh, referral along with a signed release of information, um, and then their outpatient coordinator would contact the family to start setting up that initial um, session. <clears throat> Outpatient coordinator contacts the guardian. At that point, myself, with, if everything, when, once everything is um, established with Northwest Passage, myself and the clinician would coordinate a start date based on um, the student's schedule. I would likely do a soft introduction between the student and the clinician. <laughs> And then as part of the intake process, guardians are given contact information, including hours of service for the clinician assigned to their child so they can ask specific questions about the process um, or anything that they can offer, any information that the provider could offer regarding ongoing services. Um, termination of services, when the clinician believes they've supported the student in accomplishing their goals, they'll consult with the student's guardian as well as myself to discuss a termination of services. Um, and then important to note that a parent could terminate services at any point. So um, if they decided that they were, they felt that their child had reached their goals or they wanted to go a different direction, they're able to end those services at any time and then we would have that opening to consider other students. Um, we would have an MOU in place. They're currently working on that right now. Um, there was a pretty standard one that I had shared um, for Northwest Passage to consider, so they're kind of going through, working through that process. That's reviewed and signed annually by both the district and uh, Northwest. Purpose of the MOU is to outline how we work together to provide students the services that they need. Um, upon approval from the Board of Education, we would be able to start as early as February 22nd of this year. Um, they're looking at Spooner Middle School as a pilot site to just to kind of get our feet planted and make sure that this is something that is gonna work well for uh, both entities. And then the consideration for expansion of services within the district would be based on further approval from the district as well as Northwest and Washburn County, um, student needs, resources that they have available, and then that program evaluation. Again, just kind of 
going slow to go fast, making sure that <clears throat> things are working before we expand. Is the information I have for you. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes, go ahead, Joe. Are all these counseling services done in the school or off-site? In the school. During school time? Mm -hmm. During school hours, correct. Is that not disruptive to other kids, or is there a problem with uh, maybe kids discovering somebody's getting counseling and they, you know, they, they pick on them or whatever? Is that a problem that you see? I mean, is it, is it a discreet place in the school, or...? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we um, have not had that issue to this point that I've been aware of. We mm -hmm. have a, when when we did the school renovation, they turned the old office space into kind of a student services suite. So there's a, there's a confidential space within that area. Um, often what will have, do, have happened is providers will walk down on their own, obviously after checking into the office, they'll set up shop and then we'll call the student down. Um, so really there's no, the students don't know why they're being okay. called down. Other students don't know why they're being called down to meet with their providers. I just wondered about the confidentiality of the whole process. Yep, it's a it's a private space. Um, there's a a little there is a little window to the door that enters the room, but there's a little curtain that can be closed and a sign out the out of <clears throat> outside of it that just asks to not disturb. So try to be considerate of their confidentiality, mm -hmm. privacy. Any other questions at all? Yes, go ahead, Terry. So I was, I interpreted it as 30 minutes per student. So one um, Northwest Passage person was there basically a full day mm -hmm. rotating through, not 30 minutes total. Correct. So okay. they, right, they're with us all day, 30 minutes of, con minutes of consultation <laughs> with uh, myself or, like I said, a related staff person or relevant <coughs> staff person. And then likely around an hour or so, maybe 45 minutes or so, with each of the five students they see on that day. Does that make sense? Yeah, that it, that yeah it totally does. Just, can I ask a follow-up? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, to Joe's point, um, is there a way to do it, uh, coincide the uh, with Rails time? Or, you know, their more free time or anything it like that? Just be. because. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it, maybe not a deal breaker, but just in consideration. Yep, currently how that works when we have um, <clears throat> outpatient counselors or community-based providers coming in is they'll check in with me, we'll look over their schedule, and then we'll choose times during the day that are least disruptive to um, those, oftentimes their core classes what is what we're, we're kind of trying to work around. Mm -hmm. right. Any uh, further questions then? Thank you again for the presentation. Um, so do we have... Um, no, 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 we're Thank good. You. Okay. Um, so, um, do we have consensus to move that to the regular meeting? Yes. 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 Okay. And moving on to item E, discuss the SHS ACT exam <coughs> plan. Mr. Schurz. <coughs> so, uh, you're all aware ACT is a pretty high stake test for our students and uh, certainly uh, for our school and school district. A few years ago, we went to um, all juniors the day of the test due to prevent distractions and uh, things that can go wrong on the ACT. And we um, are able to uh, create small environments for our students to take the test. It's worked out very, very well. And again, we'd like to do that again this year. All right, anyone have any questions at this time for Mr. Schurz? No? Okay. Do a consensus to move that to the regular meeting as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Moving on to item F, the um, Safe at School Plan Review and Ms. Um, <coughs> District Nurse, Ms. Folk. Hi, everyone. Um, I am... I just have our plan up here. Most of you have seen it before, and um, I just have a couple of proposed changes to the plan, so I'm just going to run through and kind of talk about. I'd like, I know this plan, it was developed so that we can address any health or safety concerns that might arise, and our uh, times have changed a little bit since we're not in a pandemic anymore, so 
Um, I am proposing that one change that we make is that we just um, review this on an annual basis. I think we discussed this before at the beginning of each year and as needed as, you know, as we see fit. So um, my first change is that we move it to annual instead of biannual. Um, and then the next one, everything else is basically the same. Um, within this, we have the same normal and then elevated levels of function. Um, and that's based, we've got attendance is affected by level normal, level elevated, so just two different levels. Um, the next section is what does instructional format look like um, at each school for normal and elevated, um, special considerations for technology, special education, all of this is the same. And then the COVID-19 health office procedures is still maintained in the plan. The biggest change, I just cleaned up a little wording and then added our um, COVID-19 testing that we have now COVID-19 tests available um, for students and families to take home upon request. So that's really the, the biggest thing that, that's changed per last month's approval. Any questions? Yeah, Joe. Just curious, Leah, who, who makes the decision, decision on what level we're at and what's the criteria for going to an elevated level? You know, I think that might be um, above me to decide or answer that question. Any administrator want to address it, it, that? It's an, actually, that's a part of the plan if you look into it. A little more closely. Well, those I did, but I don't see where those decisions <laughs> are are made. Can you hear me in the back, back there? Okay. Those the <coughs> the level uh, should a pandemic uh, situation present itself in the future, uh, th that level is going to be determined ultimately uh, in the district with board board uh, review, uh, and we would um, consult with our uh, district medical advisor, the MD that we work with, and also with the county health department. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions at this time? No. Thank you again. Oh. Nope, just okay, thank, you. thank you again for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so do we have consensus to move this to the regular meeting as well? Yes. 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 Okay. Moving on to um, item G, the um, Wisconsin Association of School Boards Convention reports. And so we will start with um, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you for the board for allowing me to go. Um, we went down on the Tuesday uh, morning uh, for the early session. The first one I attended was the Navigating Challenging Discussions and Engaging Your Community. and. Um, after what we saw tonight, I guess this is pretty much what it was. It's all sorts of hot wedge issues that communities are being faced with today. And um, what role the district plays in you know, keeping things flowing smoothly. Um, uh, the other, I went to a session on, that was on Tuesday. Then Tuesday night we went to, the three of us went to the dinner uh, with our insurance company. That was rather exciting to sit and talk to them and get their feedback on what's happening with their health care and for our staff, and they, they were able to break it down by district and tell us exactly how we're doing. They know how much they brought in, they know how much they paid out. Um, they give us all sorts of ideas how to cut our costs, and um, it was nice to actually see people and talk to them. Um, one of the biggest things I, I said to them was the problem is, is that once we find out what our increase is, we only have about three months to either renew or go somewhere else, and that's clearly not enough time for us to go somewhere else. So we're kind of in a pickle when they give us 90-day notice of increase of a certain percentage. Um, then we had, uh, the next morning was, uh, I had went to a, uh, creating a culture of wellness. That was a course where, they, what they were doing is they, it's a larger school district that has almost a thousand <coughs> employees and what they did was they opened up a on-site healthcare clinic for their staff and, and um, employees and their um, children. So you could have people coming to the doctor's office while they were at school or after school or before making appointments. And um, basically giving them a chance to get themselves 
free health care at work, but was tied to their health insurance premiums. So they saved about $2 million um, by doing it that way. But they were having an on-site nurse that would come in or a doctor that would come in and do prescriptions. And they had a, uh, uh, had a deal cut with Costco that was sending them to their homes. So they were getting their health care and prescriptions while they were at work without having to go to the doctor. Um, it was a seemed to work out real well. Um, then after that, we had our dedicated hall time. Um, There's nothing really new. I didn't see a whole lot. I've been there before, so there was not a whole lot of new things going on in the hall. Um, there was another one I went to that later in that day was called Follow the Money, and that was an interesting way to follow basically where the educational dollars in the state are going, how they work through from the state to the district to outside uh, outside schools, um, basically in the um, legislature that brings it on and why things are happening that way. You know, whether you like it or not, that's, that's the way it is. You just have to understand it, it's more important than agreeing. Um, the next one I went to was later that afternoon was the Title IX updates, and that had to do with pretty much what we were talking about here this morning again, is basically saying that, you know, sometimes you set policies that you don't agree with, but to protect your district, you have, a, you have an obligation as a board member to make sure your district is protected. Um, um, another one I went to later that afternoon was on uh, community education and building support. Um, that had to do with basically listening to your community, how they're, come, how they're saying, and trying to figure out how do you compromise or do what's best for your district when your community doesn't agree with it. Um, uh, Next one I went to after that, I think, was an inclusion advocacy. And that had to do with, again, the same thing we we're dealing here with, with here tonight is how do you take students that don't feel like they're part of the system to be able to bring them in and let them know that they, they are and you care about what they're saying. Um, I think then we went to the Wasby luncheon. We saw the superintendent of the year. I got to listen to him. And then um, the, the breakfast, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the breakfast. We got to see um, another fine speaker sit and talk about troubles in life and education and how do you get back on your feet and recover. Um, I went to another one here was uh, strengthening your board's effectiveness. Again, you know, sitting and listening to your staff and you know, ask them what do you need and how, why are we, what do you need, how can we help you basically is what they're saying in that one. Um, I went to the WASB legislative update which had to do with what currently is being proposed in their legislature and what has been accepted so far and where they're at on different things. Gave us the ability to look them up online so you can look up a, a bill and see where it's at. And um, what that comes back to is legislative update is tied in with the platform and resolution, resolutions that happens at the other meeting was that when all the districts sit together and say, we vote on X, Y, and Z. And this is what, what our platform is going to be moving forward. Then they send that over to our, our legislative people, and they're the ones that go back and start lobbying for us. Um, another one I went to was a growing your own. And what that is is it's talking about growing your own educators and your own staff through your own pipeline, through your students. Take your students and say, <coughs> if you like to teach here in Spooner School District, this is how what we can do for you. And what they're doing is they're sitting them down and they're giving them college level courses and saying X, Y, Z, and this is how you do it. And basically giving them some guidance so that they can come back and um, hopefully join your district. Um, and I think that was it. The, the final on Friday, I, we didn't go to the session at 10 o'clock, so we missed out on seeing the governor. Okay. But other than that, we were on our way home early. All right. Thank you. Um, and Mr. White. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also thank the district for allowing me to go to the convention. I always learn a lot when I go down there. This is my second year that I've gone down there. Um, Dr. Aslan and Paul and I left on a Tuesday. We got down there and I attended a session right away with Dr. Aslan called School Finance Puzzle. Uh, that's something I'm trying to get a handle on. It's very uh, complicated how schools are financed, but I, it seems to me I'm starting to get a better picture of how that works. So. 
Uh, we learned about the major components of the Wisconsin school finance system. We became acquainted with the basics of the budget cycle, revenue limits, equalization aid, which by the way affects our district the most, and property taxes and referendums and learn how these components interrelate and impact school board decision making. On Wednesday then, uh, I attended a CESA 11 breakfast since I am the I'm on the board of control for CESA 11 and they, they entertained us there with a breakfast in the morning. Following that, I went to an open session with the entire delegation and listened to the Milwaukee School of Languages String Orchestra performance, which was very, very well uh, performed. Talented kids down there. Witnessed awards for administrators and educators of the year in addition to student art awards. And we listened to some speakers at that general session. Jill Underly, the state super education superintendent, gave a speech. And we heard from keynote speaker, best-selling author, uh, New York Times best-selling author, Sean Covey. He spoke on, spoke on four roles leaders play that are highly predictive of success and, fundament, and fundamental to what every effective leader needs to know and do. He claims, you know, all leaders must inspire trust, create vision, execute strategy, and coach potential. Wednesday afternoon, I was uh, representing our school board at the WASB Delegate Assembly. At that time, we voted on various policies that will guide the, so the association's legislative agenda on education. We passed 11 resolutions there, and most of them were amended to some degree, but the uh, session didn't last half as long as it did last year. Last year it went over time and we couldn't even get finished with the agenda. This year was done fairly, fairly uh, rapidly. Thursday morning then I attended the WASB breakfast. We listened to a very inspirational speech by Kelsey Tanish, who was an individual with significant physical challenges, who spoke about the power of persistence and perspective. That was really a, an inspirational speech. Then I attended a session titled A Deep Dive into School Finance, What Board Members Need to Know. I figure I, there's more of these I can go to, the more, <laughs> the better off I'll be to understand this whole procedure. But the discussion went into a more detail on the revenue limit formula, which is a cap that sets the total dollars that can be raised through state equalization aids and local property taxes for each district. It would also presented an introduction to calculation of state equalization aids based on three variables, which include each district spending, property tax base, and enrollment. Those all three, three of those things are, have a big effect on our school funding. Following that, I attended a session called Park Public Participation and School Board Members, and we identify the relevant legal and policy considerations school boards can use to guide discussions during meetings which was very appropriate to what we've been experiencing here in Spooner. Following that, I attended a general session featuring the Middle, Middleton High School Chamber Wind Ensemble. Uh, they uh, also gave awards for longevity to school members. Uh, there was one in particular that was on the school board for 50 years. He wasn't there, but he, he, he was acknowledged. <laughs> Uh, we had a speech from the WASB president and the incoming president. Then the keynote speech was very uh, inspirational and entertaining. It was from ABC correspondent and TV show host John Kenyonis, who you may have seen on TV over the years. He talked about believing in oneself, never giving up, and always doing the right thing. He's going to host a television show, I think that airs in the end of February, uh, called Doing the Right Thing, basically, where he he plants secret cameras in a situation and films people. He gives it. A, he gives an opportunity for people to do the right thing, and he makes a. It's like candid camera, and he wants to see how people react and if they actually do the right thing or not. And then he goes and interviews them afterwards. So it's pretty entertaining. Friday morning, I attended a session called School School Library Hot Topics which included information on how districts can ensure their libraries have access to quality resources, what makes a library feel welcoming, and how libraries can update their policies surrounding book challenges. Following that, I went to a session titled The Power of Community Conversation, 
building trust, collaboration, and positive change. This was presented by the Chippewa Falls uh, Area School District. They discuss ways that community conversations encourage participation and engagement, facilitate collaboration among diverse stakeholders, increase transparency and accountability, and identify areas for improvement when discussing public education. And then we came back to Spooner, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And um, Dr. Aslan. Uh, I, I too want to thank the district and the school board for the opportunity to attend the state convention. Uh, certainly one of the best opportunities for professional learning, uh, regardless if you're a, a board member or a district employee during the course of the year. I attended a number of sessions regarding finance and uh, a different environment than 12 months ago because 12 months ago we were rolling into the start of a new biennial budget and and now we're we're in the middle of it but uh, you know as uh, Mr. Weiss had, had shared it's districts like Spooner that continue to get really get the short end in the equalized aid formula as it as it exists in its current form and that is because of static or declining enrollment and rapidly increasing property values. So um, certainly no promises coming out of that, but I think all three of us left Milwaukee with a real clear understanding that the next 12 months, more districts will be out for operational referendum than at any time in the state's history. So um, there's hope that when the next biennial budget development time comes around, that our lawmakers will see there's a need to change that formula that will soon be 31 years old. Uh, one one uh, ray of uh, hope that gave us some optimism in the finance department is um, a, a move afoot that may happen in this biennial budget that would increase the state's reimbursement rate for special special education funding to 60 percent and just uh, to give you some perspective right now here in Spooner they they reimburse about 34 percent and because of that the district transfers well over a million dollars a year out of the general fund to the special education fund because by law that fund must be balanced at the end of the fiscal year I also attended uh, some sessions on self-funding district health insurance. Uh, we are among the top three employers in Washburn County. And for those employees that are 30 hours a week or more, that is one of the health insurance is one of the benefits that are available. It, it's expensive. It gets more expensive every year uh, to be able to afford to offer a plan here. Uh, we've had to do a high deductible plan and uh, we're interested in learning more about a self-funded option as a way to continue to be an employer that provides good benefits and be able to provide those benefits in a uh, fiscally responsible manner. So again, thank you for the opportunity to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions at this time? No? Okay, we'll receive that information and place it on file. Okay, moving on to item H, discuss library media specialist position, Mr. Miller. Okay, excuse me. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is to give you a little background and information <coughs> along with the uh, eventual recommendation for a library media specialist position or service. Um, I'll start out with some background information and that is first of all with the Library Media Center. I think everybody hopefully knows or realizes that is an area of the school district that is intended to be kind of the hub of the school that houses a lot of resources to provide our staff and students with access to information, where they can either find information, broaden their knowledge base, <coughs> and develop a lifelong passion for reading and knowledge. 
In addition to that, in recent years, it's also become a place to access content creation tools to utilize that information in a way that they need to meet the project or goal or whatever they have to do. So with that being said, um, prior to the 22-23 school year, this district had staffed a full-time library media specialist in our district, and that person's role was to basically oversee the library media center operations following some pretty specific state mandates and guidelines in terms of how materials are acquired mm -hmm. and what materials are eligible, <laughs> eligible to be required and that type of thing. Additionally, they have provided supervision or leadership for library media instruction that occurs within our building media centers, more so in the elementary and into the middle school, but across the entire district. And finally, they have been charged with working with our staff K-12 to utilize those media center resources and information technology literacy skills to bring back into the classroom to expand that use of that information with our students to enhance education or their learning in the classroom as well as in the media center. Uh, that being said, at the end of the 22 school year, we found ourselves due to some staffing changes without an LMC person and some uncertainty. And at that time, the district uh, made the, or followed the recommendation to go with a contracted service of a licensed media specialist provide those services to meet state, state mandates in terms of reviewing the purchases of materials and supervising the instruction that was incurring in our media centers. For this current school year, we attempted to partner with other area schools to have a shared or joint library media specialist position. As you're well aware from last fall, that position did not come to fruition and we reverted back to our model for the 22-23 school year of contracted services slightly different so that we can ensure that we are meeting state mandates and making sure information or materials are being acquired appropriately and instruction is being supervised. With all that being said, when we look at our current status, uh, it's a fair assumption to basically say we are presently meeting the state mandates. Um, based on the experiences of the past two years, having a person, a consultant who's been a They've been excellent consultants. People are highly qualified and have done a great job. But one day a week coming into the district or once a month for purchasing resources just does not allow us to meet the potential of what we have in our media centers available to our staff and students to enhance the learning instruction that takes place in our classrooms. So with that being said, looking at the need for a district media center specialist, either role or service, and I'm looking at in terms of a person or a position, is you first just need it from a state perspective of DPI requirements, and that is the 902 licensure is required for that person to be a library media, library media specialist to basically vet and oversee the resources that are going into our media centers along with the instruction is occurring in the media centers. In addition, that person needs to oversee daily operations that are handled by three paraprofessionals in each of those media centers and make sure that the materials are on the shelf, they're, they're being accessible to students and staff. And I also think this is an important note to make here. I have a sub bullet and that is the funding of our media centers in this district has always been through the common school fund. And it's generally been enough for us to meet the needs. However, in the last two years, the way things have worked out at state level, we have seen a huge infusion of common school funds. In 2021, 2022, this district received 57,400 some dollars in change for common school funds. This year, we're receiving $90,000 for common school funds. That money comes with the intent of being spent in our media centers for a very specific list of materials that are intended to promote those goals I've mentioned of finding information, building on a love of reading, and being able to access that information and manipulate it with content creation materials. In other words, do something with the information. So with that being said, this district finds ourselves in a position now of being able to re, uh, restat, to update our collections in all three building media centers, along with expanding those collections in a manner that we can put resources in there that will help our staff in the classrooms <laughs> facilitate what they're doing to improve learning and instruction. And to do that, you really need somebody there with that background to be making sure we're putting good resources, appropriate resources, in front of our staff and students, and the third bullet that I have on the list here is working with the staff and students so that they can maximize the use of those resources, not only in the media center, but outside the media center. 
So with that being said, if you start to consider the idea of a library media specialist position, the first thing that will probably come up for is we're putting something back. How are we going to uh, take care of financing it or funding it? And I'm going to just toss that back over to Dr. Aslan for a minute here to talk about how we might do that. Yep. Thanks, Mr. Miller. So uh, again, this is bringing a position back that we had previously but doing it in a way that acknowledges the fact that we all know at this table that the district will face some financial challenges into the future, all things remaining equal. So doing it in a way that's fiscally responsible and sustainable. Approximately half of what this position would cost would come from funds that we are currently allocating to library media consultation and from Title I. Uh, part of the change to the position would be understanding that this job would need to have some flex in it, would be library media, some tech integration, and we would look to uh, team the math resource person with this job. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One is finances, as I've already mentioned, but second, it goes deeper than that. Wisconsin Act 20, as, as we've discussed, is the very first piece of state mandated curriculum in the history of public education in this state. And it deals with early literacy. We know that the implementation of that act will be a heavy lift for the next three years at least. We have one, currently one title funded resource person in the district and they uh, wear two hats. They're English language arts and math, and so uh, what we would propose in response to the Demands Act 20 and the need to be fiscally prudent that the existing coach just be English language arts and that our math coach be part-time. The remainder of those funds would be built into the budget and they would come out of the general fund, out of Fund 10. I guess any questions about that or? And, yep, go ahead, Joe. You can't use common school funds for no. positions, right? No, you cannot okay. for any kind of funded position or anything or a contracted service. <clears throat> so uh, based on that, the administrative staff has discussed this at length and we have created a updated job description that reflects the library media specialist along with some of those math duties that Dr. Aslan mentioned along with tech integration. And we are just looking for you to consider that job description. And if you feel comfortable with that, um, authorizing the district to look forward or move forward, taking steps to reinstate the position and then take steps to hire that position, find a qualified individual to fill it. And so I don't know if you have questions by any of the information I've touched on. Yep. Just one question. Does it, would, would that impact anybody else's jobs that are currently in the district? Uh, one any, when you say impact. Uh, impact as far as change their job description or change them out of, move them out of a particular job or. Not unless somebody were to apply for a job internally here. I okay. mean, we're looking for this as a uh, separate position. No. So the existing positions like the paraprofessionals <laughs> that staff the media centers note proposed change to that. Okay. This would be an addition to. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions? at all. I appreciate the district's recognition of the importance of research and curating a question. library media collection. It's an important role that we've missed. Yep. Go would, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Would this be a, something that could possibly come from a CISA uh, or we have we tried to uh, look into that? We're working through that right now. Um, and I know CISA 11 did not offer it in the past. They have said they are more open to offering it. Currently we have contracted some of our, we have contracted services here going two routes and that's because of the late nature of how we established it. We contracted the purchasing of materials through CISA 10 who have a licensed media specialist on staff to oversee that. And we have a person who is a retired library media specialist that is working for us. Uh, if you go back, look 15 days, or I'm sorry, 30 days over the course of this year to come in and oversee some of that instruction and help our paras with some of the daily maintenance or overseeing the operation of the media center. So it's possible, but I guess I can just tell you that it's my experience is you really need somebody 
on the ground in the district, you know, throughout the school year, <coughs> if we're going to stay on top of this and effectively utilize our resources and make sure we have appropriate resources. And I'd take you back to the start of this fiscal year where, as Mr. Miller said, not a service offered by our home CESA, CESA 11, but we did seek a proposal from CESA 10, mm -hmm. and it was uh, cost prohibitive. Okay. It, Paul, and then we'll my, my, my question is that uh, when I look at the licensure, licensure required, um, what's the probability we're going to find somebody with this? In it's a tough one? position to fill. Nobody's going to dispute that. But given the nature of where we are, there's two ways of looking at this. One, I think we owe it to ourselves to go out and find somebody that has that licensure that mm -hmm. can show they have the skills to meet. And if that did not come to fruition, then you can look to find somebody that is able to get those get that licensure by working towards it through a <coughs> through program. Is that um, like working through within again? Are we, is there anybody from within we could bring to that level if we need to? It's p possible, but I would like to, to, I guess it would be my desire yeah. that we take a good look to make sure there's not somebody in around or wants to be part of our community, internal or external, okay. that wants to lead this program forward in a way that it's successful. Right, what I see here is this is a mandated position, but there's nobody out there really. It's a mandated license, it's not license. necessarily a mandated right. position. Correct. Um, there are people out there, but they are few and far yeah. between, right. um, and the they, state realizes that. And, and, they can to and they can ask whatever they want then, like we experienced with CESA. They're going to put the number out there and you're, you're It's a possibility. Um, I can just tell you that districts are finding ways to make it work, and I think we can, but a good spot to start is just find out whether or not somebody is interested in being part of this community. I appreciate, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Michelle had a question. I just sorry. was going to ask that question yep. if we had anybody in the district that has we have anything close to the license that would then go on. There's uh, one person that would have that license, and there are some others that either were working towards it or anybody that had a passion for it technically could pursue that program, but they would have to go through a uh, number of steps. And I can tell you in districts that have been filling the positions, they've been trying to look for somebody that has experience both in education and <coughs> That's what we're asking for anyway, yeah. with the math. So. Well, yes, really. Would, would this be a feasible position to share with another school district uh, well, nearby? We went down or that not? road and uh, the ground fell out from under us it last did. August. Um, okay. Trying to work with another area district and uh, for whatever reason they backed out on us. Um, and I can tell you the larger districts around us, uh, I've talked to them, they are you know, they're staffing their own, and uh, smaller districts around us have either found somebody to step in or finding somebody that can work towards that licensure. Okay, all right, any other questions at all then? No, okay, do we have consensus to move this to the regular meeting then? Yes, yep. yes. all right. Moving on to um, item I, discuss truck replacement, Dr. Aslan. Yep, so coming to you with kind of a unconventional financial and equipment request this evening. So, uh, you know, the district owns uh, two pickup trucks and, and the one in question is the 2002 Chevrolet half ton and uh, and you know, we're on our, our third third break in, in the frame as GM trucks of that era just are prone to, to frame rust. Um, it, it's used its useful service, but it is a, a very important piece of equipment. It's the buildings and grounds truck, so it doesn't plow snow or anything like that. It hauls things. It doesn't leave the city limits in almost all cases. If you have priced new vehicles at all in the past year or so, the price has gone through the roof. And we know that purchasing a new pickup truck to <coughs> replace that 22-year-old vehicle is just not viable financially, nor is it responsible. Uh, so the ask is this, we'd ask for an authorization to spend up to $30,000 for a used pickup truck. And we'd, we'd ask you that 
just with the assurance that uh, it is built into the budget this year for vehicle replacement. Now we've typically got sealed bids because we purchased new equipment and that would not be a possibility with a used vehicle because they're on lots and then gone. So, um, you know, again, just because this is kind of an unconventional situation, what we would do is uh, certainly reach out to, to reputable dealers of used vehicles, multiple ones, uh, with, uh, you know, what we seek, what, which would be a used pickup, but a serviceable pickup uh, below 90,000 miles and preferably a half ton for the work that it does. And... Uh, see what they'd be able to do and again um see what kind of price they could come back with so um the 30,000 would be a not to exceed could uh, very well come in lower than that four wheel drive necessary we we would need a four wheel drive vehicle just because it's got to be an all season asset okay any other questions at this time for Dr. Adlin regarding that okay do we have consensus to move this to the regular meeting? Yes. Yes, okay. Moving on to item J, the 30, 60, 90 day planning. Everyone, I hope, had a chance to review that. That information is available. Um, any questions at all? No, okay. And we have that information on file. Then moving on to the item K, financial update, Dr. Aslan. Providing a financial update for the month of December, 2023. Uh, total income was $776,794.11. District expenditures were $1,362,580.79. So cash on hand at the end of December was $237,674.38. Uh, $237, and just to contrast that, with December of 2022, so looking back uh, 12 months, cash on hand at the end of that period was $615 and $5.23. Okay, any questions on any of that? No, okay. Do, oh, yep, oh, sorry. sorry. Do nope. we know why roughly 300 or $400,000 difference? We do. If you if you look back at uh, the sources of income for December 2023 versus December 2022, in 2022 we had a significant inflow of ESSER money, both ESSER two and ESSER three dollars, and now we know that we're on the downhill slide of that funding. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions at all? Then no. Okay. We'll receive that information, place it on file. Um, moving on to item L, um, approval of the vouchers. Do we have, um, everyone had a chance to review that? Do we have consensus to move that to the regular meeting as a part of the consent agenda? Yes. 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 Okay. And then now we're on to section three, to convene into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.851. C, to consider the employment promotion and compensation or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or ex exercises responsibility. Do we have a motion to move into closed session? Yes. Yeah. Second. Second. For, who put, we have a first and a second. Jesse, you got that? And then um, we need a roll call for that, please. Yes. 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 Oh. All right. We are in closed session. Thank you. Okay. The time now is 7.52. I'm sorry, 7.55. We were in closed session until 7.52, and the board took no action. I make a motion. We adjourn. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. 7.55. <laughs> we're adjourned. Good night, folks.